Welcome back, Pahrump. I'm Dr. Michael Reiner, um, host of the uh, Independent Doctors of Pahrump. Um, glad you could join us tonight. Um, I was hoping to continue our um, discussion about weight, weight loss, and sleep apnea. Uh, on a previous show, I had uh, Arthur, uh, the uh, owner and operator of um, Pahrump Medical Supply, um, demonstrating some of the breathing equipment and some of the oxygen supplies um, that he uses uh, when we prescribe that for patients. Um, with that discussion, I kind of went in and out of some slides and I really didn't think I did a very, you know, good job of uh, presenting sleep apnea. And I wanted to go back and review some of that information um, so that you, the viewer, has an understanding on why we prescribe that. You know, look at some of the symptoms you may have, look at some of the issues that may be uh, present in your life, uh, and uh, bring them to your healthcare provider. Um, my understanding of, of where we are today with regards to weight and sleep apnea um, is that, you know, I, I was listening to a, another physician talk one day and he was talking about um, pain management and talking about that uh, there were cases where patients um, were basically using uh, pain medication and they weren't being evaluated for uh, sleep apnea. Um, and the type of sleep apnea is a little bit different than than what we may see in just purely obese patients. Um, you could take a normal person and by all stretch of the imagination wouldn't expect them to have sleep apnea and put them on a sleeping medication or put them on a pain medication and they develop a shallow breathing and in fact that's what pain medications do. They actually uh, reduce the work of breathing and so you get a mocked situation or a, a pseudo sleep apnea um, and that's called alveolar hypoventilation and I guess to break that down in, in terms of medical uh, uh, layman's terminology that means that the alveoli or the end part of our circulation um, it it doesn't receive the oxygen or the breathing effort that it should. Therefore, your uh, oxygen saturations are lower. And while you're under the influence of a pain medication or a sleeping aid, uh, you think you're sleeping just fine, but your body um, is not. And by that, I mean that the oxygen levels definitely fall to a, a dangerous level in some people. Um, and this causes long-term uh, changes in your body, such as heart disease and things of that nature. Um, and again, we want to review a little bit about that weight loss that we talked about and the, and the calories. Remember, uh, 3,500 calories equals a pound. Um, so if you're trying to lose weight, if you can just eliminate one to 200 calories a day out of your diet, if it's 100 calories a day, that's basically 10 pounds a year. If it's 200 calories a day, um, that's going to be 20 pounds a year. If it's 10 calories a day, that's 20 pounds in 20 years. Um, it's really simple math. And you just have to look for a place um, to do that. So I want to go back to the slide that I previously talked about um, where we uh, list the type of sleep apneas. And, and if you can see on your screen, the first one is what we call um, basically obstructive sleep apnea. That's called OSA for short. And it is the most common category of a sleep disordered breathing. Um, and that encompasses most of everything, uh, whether it's due to medication, whether it's due to obesity, whether it's due to some other factor. Um, that's the most common one. Um, then we have what's known as central sleep apnea, uh, otherwise known as CSA um, breathing. And this is uh, really a central uh, brain where the brain is just not telling you to breathe. Um, and believe it or not, some forms of central sleep apnea are actually improved with sleeping medication. I don't understand the paradox completely, but that is probably the only place where I think um, it may be useful in that area. The other one is the mild occasional sleep apnea, such as you get with an upper respiratory infection, um, meaning due to airway swelling and congestion, it may interfere with your ability uh, to breathe. Um, 
and again, those are, are, are limited, those are not serious, at least the last one. It is not something that needs to be treated on a regular basis. It is a very mild case and usually goes away when the infection goes away, rarely does it stay. Um, going to the next slide, um, again, we want to talk about who really is at risk of developing sleep apnea uh, or really who is at risk of possibly having sleep apnea. Um, obviously, uh, it's anybody with a BMI of greater than 30. Um, body mass index is what BMI stands for, and it is a uh, condition where uh, you basically, um, it just basically tells you the amount of fat that you have in your body. Um, and there is a mathematical formula for it. You can go to any computer um, and type in your height and your weight and you will uh, get a BMI. Uh, just for frames of references, if you're young uh, and your BMI is high, it's a false high. Um, if you're older and your BMI looks high, it might be a more of a true representation just due to the fact that muscle is a little bit heavier than fat. Um, anybody who has a large neck circumference might be at risk of developing sleep apnea and I've listed below what those sizes are 16 inches uh, in a woman and 17 inches in a man. So if your neck is greater than that size then you might be at risk and I know if you may not be observant like I am, but a lot of times um, when you're looking at uh, women and you see they have these long, sleek, scent, uh, slender necks, um, and you look at males and they're broad shouldered like me and we got a short neck, um, then um, that's someone who you might consider having sleep apnea. And you're going to put that together with a total clinical picture um, of what that particular uh, person um, uh, might be experiencing. Again, uh, the other part of that is if you're taking another risk factor would be if you're um, using uh, pain medications, um, sleeping medications, um, those are at risk if you have enlarged tonsils and a large tongue volume. Um, a lot of times in children, uh, you will see children that develop um, tonsillitis or swelling of their tonsils and you'll see them snoring and you'll actually get them to, um, uh, you, you'll just see them kind of, you know, kind of stop breathing. Um, and that is probably the number one reason why we remove tonsils in children. Um, and you'll start to see the fact that they just, they, they get a throat infection. Tonsils are basically lymph organs. And when you're young, you're processing all the antigens that your body is being exposed to, whether it be cold, flus, viruses, you know, kids put dirty stuff in their mouth, uh, they, they get exposed to all this stuff, um, and their throat or their mouth is not as big as, as an adult. So therefore, when tonsils swell, uh, they're swelling in a, in a closed space and more significant with regards to how they can obstruct an airway. Um, so tonsillectomy is, is probably the number one, I mean, large tonsils and adenoids in children. And you actually see growth deprivation in children that have large tonsils and adenoids. So for our pediatric population um, and their parents, if you see your children um, having a lot of trouble breathing at night and snoring, um, that might be a time to you know, visit uh, your local pediatrician or primary care doctor, uh, have them evaluated by an ear, nose, and throat doctor. Um, surgery is always the last option, but sometimes it's necessary in that group. Um, the other thing we might want to talk about, again, were the upper respiratory infections and things like that that, that may cause um, intermittent sleep apnea. Uh, we're going to go to the next slide, um, which talks about um, some of the symptoms um, of sleep apnea and uh, some of the things that people may experience. Now you'll notice that these are a, a broad range of, of symptoms um, and they can be in just about any clinical category of disease. So, and that's what you'll find if you pick up the PDR, which is this physician's desk reference and start reading that or the Merck manual, um, 
I mean, there's just so many symptoms that overlap. So not to get confused by uh, reading into uh, symptoms, but those are the things that, um, and when we, when we come back from break, we're, we're going to talk more in depth of the uh, symptoms of sleep apnea and, and things that, uh, that may, uh, you may be experiencing. But you have to take the whole picture uh, you have to see the whole forest, not just the trees. Just because you may have one of those symptoms doesn't mean you have sleep apnea. Um, but when you take the whole triad or the whole complex uh, level of uh, symptoms in there, then you might very well have mild sleep apnea. Um, and you just bring it to your a medical provider. Hopefully that person is uh, in tune with uh, trying to get you uh, treated for that um, and we'll go into later how we uh, diagnose and, and treat that. Um, so let's look at that again that slide uh, for the first symptom we'll talk about is irritability, mood swings, and depression. Um, a lot of people can become irritable, a lot of people have mood swings, but the irritability and the mood swings actually come from a lack of sleep. Um, how many people have you seen that have been up for 24 hours because of work or things of that nature and they're just plain mean, um, they're irritable. Um, and if it allows irritability and the lack of sleep allows to continue uh, for a prolonged period of time, uh, depression can set in. Um, and, you know, be aware that just because you're depressed doesn't mean you have sleep apnea, but if you have sleep apnea, it's untreated, um, you certainly could develop uh, some depression. Uh, learning and memory difficulties um, would be the next symptom. And, you know, people who have difficulty um, retaining information and people have difficulty memorizing, memorizing things um, certainly have had problems with sleep apnea among other things. Okay, we're going to go to break. Uh, when we come back, we'll, bring, we'll pick that up and discuss that second symptom a little bit longer in more detail. Thank you for tuning in tonight, Pranam.